In this recording, we're going to discuss capillary exchange. We've previously mentioned the difference between your arteries, your veins, and your capillaries. So keep in mind that your capillaries are very, very, very small and thin, and this is where we do exchange of materials. Typically, we find our capillaries in clusters known as capillary beds. There are basically four ways that we can move substances across a capillary. We've mentioned them previously, but just to reiterate, we can do diffusion of lipid, solu lipid soluble substances straight through the plasma membrane. Okay. If we're doing diffusion of lipid insoluble substances, we have to go through pores, okay, those little holes that we've mentioned. We could do osmosis of water into or out of the cell. Or if we're talking about larger substances, we could do endo and exocytosis through the capillary cell walls. And just to remind you what this looks like, okay, lipid solubles go right through the plasma membrane. Lipid insolubles have to go through pores. Osmosis also through pores. Or endo exocytosis. We have to put them in vesicles to get them to the other side. Okay. All right, now that we're refreshed, let's talk about the pressures that you find at your capillaries. Okay. So movement of water specifically across the capillary is driven by a process called filtration. Okay. Movement of a fluid by a force such as pressure or gravity. I'm not really going to focus a whole lot of gravity um, in A and P, but we are going to talk about pressures. Okay. We have two main pressures that work in the capillaries. Okay. Hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. And these two pressures promote movement in the opposite directions of each other. Your hydrostatic pressure drives water out of the capillary while the osmotic pressure draws fluid into the capillary. Okay. So these are opposing forces. Your hydrostatic pressure is basically just your blood pressure. Okay. It's the force that the fluid exerts on the wall of the vessel, or you could even show it in a container itself. Okay. So hydrostatic pressure um, is not um, solely confined to your body. Okay. So the more pressure you have at the bottom, the water shoots out a little bit higher. Okay. Um, again, this is generally equal to your blood pressure. Okay. We have mentioned previously that the fluid in the vessels, so your blood, is going to flow from an area of high pressure to low pressure. Um, this is a passive process, okay, and again, this whole idea of hydrostatic fr uh, pressure pushing fluid out of your capillaries, we call this filtration, okay. And we can see this at the capillary itself. We've got our arterial, so fluid's coming in from the left and going towards the right. It'll exit out of the venule. Okay. Hydrostatic pressure okay. at the arterial end in the capillary is about 35 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Hydrostatic pressure on the venual end has dropped to about 15 millimeters of mercury. So again, we're going from high pressure to low pressure. Okay. Hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial fluid, so outside of the capillary, it's basically zero. Okay, basically zero. All right, so not only are we going to move from high pressure to low pressure within the capillary itself, that's why fluid is going from left to right, okay. but this higher hydrostatic pressure on the arterial end is 35 compared to the zero outside okay, will cause fluid, water specifically, to move from the capillary into the interstitial fluid. Okay, this drives water out of the capillary into the interstitial fluid at the arterial end. 
Okay, so notice we're still at the arterial end. Okay. Now, osmotic pressure. Okay. Hopefully everybody remembers osmosis. Remember, osmosis, we're going to diffuse water from a high water to a low water concentration. Okay, this moves the water from a low solute concentration to a high solute concentration. The water wants to be where all the solutes are. Okay. Now, the solute particles are not moving in our example here. Only the water is moving. Okay. But wherever we have the higher solute concentration, those little solutes are basically trying to pull the water to their side. Okay, this is osmotic pressure. We're pulling water okay, towards the side that has the higher solute concentration. Now, the osmotic pressure, okay, so how strongly we are pulling, is determined by the number of particles we have, not how large the particles are. Okay, so if we only had two giant molecules, it's not going to be very good. But if we have five million tiny little particles, Okay, that's going to be a much larger osmotic pressure. We can draw a lot, much more water that way. Okay. Now, we have values associated with this as well. Okay. Osmotic pressure is about 25 millimeters of mercury. This is really caused by the proteins in the blood, specifically albumin. Proteins themselves are typically too large to leave the capillaries. Okay. So the, um, unlike the hydrostatic pressure, your osmotic pressure remains constant throughout the capillary. Okay. So it's the same both on the arterial and the venule ends. Okay. And your osmotic pressure is very low in the interstitial fluid. Okay. It's higher in the capillary. The difference in the osmotic pressure creates a gradient. And that gradient has a few names. You could hear it termed colloid osmotic pressure because blood is a colloid. Okay. Sometimes we'll abbreviate COP. I usually refer to it as blood osmotic pressure or BOP instead. Okay. Your BOP or your COP, whatever you prefer, is going to draw water back into the capillary through osmosis. Okay. So here's what that looks like. Okay. So now we're talking about our osmotic pressure. You'll notice that it is 25 millimeters of mercury on the arterial end as well as the venule end. It did not change because those solutes have not moved. Okay. You do have a few solutes in your interstitial fluid as well. Okay. But does not create a very large pressure gradient. Okay. So our number is higher inside, so where is the water going to move? Okay. It is going to move back into the capillary. Okay. So putting it all together, on the arterial end, our hydrostatic pressure was higher than our osmotic pressure. This forces water out of the capillary. We do filtration. Okay. However, on the venule end, our hydrostatic pressure has greatly decreased, so now our osmotic pressure is higher. This draws our water back into our capillary. Okay, we're going to do reabsorption. Okay. Yeah, too far. Now, net filtration pressure at the capillary. Okay. So since our um, blood osmotic pressure and our hydrostatic pressure, because they move in opposite directions, okay, you have noticed that we have different things going on at the arterial versus the venule end. But we can talk about net filtration pressure over the whole capillary as well. So hydrostatic pressure is going to push water out of the capillary. Your osmotic pressure pulls it back into the capillary. The difference between these gradients is called your net filtration pressure. And we can actually calculate that. At the arterial end, okay, we have a hydrostatic pressure of about 35 
Osmotic pressure is only about 22. Okay. So if we subtract those two numbers, we get a 13. Okay. Because this is a positive number, this tells us that the water is being forced out of the capillary by filtration. Okay. So our arterial end is favoring filtration. What about our venule end? Okay. At our venule end, hydrostatic pressure has dropped to 15, okay. but our osmotic pressure is still 22. So now, if we do subtraction, we get a negative number. Okay. This negative value tells us that we are now in favor of reabsorption. Instead, at the venule end, okay. now, we know what's happening at our arterial end, we know what's happening at our venule end, we can calculate what's happening overall, the entire capillary. Okay, So we just calculated at the arterial end we had a positive 13, Okay, we said that favored filtration. At the venule end, okay, we calculated a pressure of 7. Okay. Technically, it was a negative value, which told us we were favoring reabsorption, okay. but it's still 7. If we subtract what happens at the arterial and the venule end, we get an overall value. This is an overall positive value, which means overall we are favoring filtration. Okay. If this had been a negative value, we would have been favoring reabsorption. Would have been favoring reabsorption. So we can see that we can see all of our math here basically. These are the exact same numbers that we just worked with. Okay, we calculated a positive value at our arterial end, we calculated a negative value at our venule end. So this was favoring filtration, this was favoring reabsorption. So if we take our math overall, we are favoring filtration. Where is that fluid going? Okay, Into the interstitial fluid, does it stay there? Most of it does not because our lymphatic system comes to our rescue. Okay, Our lymphatic system is going to come to our rescue. We're going to reabsorb most of that fluid from your interstitial space. We're going to stick it in lymphatic vessels and we're going to send it back to the blood. Okay. Now, if we don't do that very well, that fluid will build up. Okay. This will cause edema or swelling. Okay. One common cause of edema could be increased um, capillary hydrostatic pressure due to hypertension. Okay. Or a decrease in osmotic pressure due to liver disease, cancer, starvation, things like that. So if you increase your hydrostatic pressure Okay, this forces more fluid um, into the tissues than normal. Okay, this would cause swelling. If you decrease osmotic pressure, that reduces how much fluid you're bringing back into the capillary normally, so more fluid would be staying in the tissues. Um, the liver disease, remember albumin is our biggest contributor to osmotic pressure, and your liver is what produces albumin. Okay. Starvation, you're not getting enough amino acids in your diet in the first place to build albumin proteins. Okay. All of these. Um, filtration would exceed reabsorption, so you are overloading your interstitial fluid with or your interstitial space with fluid and leads to edema. Okay. Peripheral edema specifically okay, would be edema of your hands and your feet. Your hydrostatic pressure is already slightly higher here because of gravity, which, you know, we're not going in detail about gravity, but everybody knows how gravity works, okay? Gravity pulls everything down, okay? Your hands down by your sides, your feet down at the bottom, okay? Um, this is even more profound um, than normal. If we have decreased um, collar osmotic pressure um, in your abdominal region specifically. Okay. This edema is just specifically called ascites. We have mentioned ascites previously when we talked about um, your liver 
failing. Okay. Um, we talked about jaundice was you know one of the symptoms of liver failure, but ascites was also a common symptom. You're not producing as much of that albumin. We are decreasing our colloid osmotic pressure. That water is going to make its way into your interstitial fluid of your abdomen. It's just going to sit there. Um, the ascites will need to be um, relieved through um, one of those giant needles that they stick in you so we can drain all that fluid. Okay. All right, and that concludes our discussion on the pressures at the capillaries.